and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the RPG Academy, the ma the madmen behind the Acat the Acaticon convention. Good, as good well pronunciation too. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm get I get the feeling a lot of people call it Arcade Con. All the time. Even I have said that before. So you know I can't blame anybody. Mm -hmm. And of uh, and more importantly, the creator and ma and madman behind the upcoming Action Twelve Cinema TTRPG. Promising B-movie action with our much-neglected 12-sided dice, the one and only Michael K. Ross. Hey, that is me! Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on. Oh, and yeah, I, I had to get I had to get the D12 joke in my system because a a um, bit that I've wanted to do for the longest time. I just haven't I just haven't had the stars aligned to do it. Is to do one of those AS, one of those sad ASPCA commercials for mm. D12s. <laughs> yes. Like little D12s in like the the dice jails like with Sarah McLaughlin playing over it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, for just 7 cents a day your your contribution can help these D12 yeah. find a home. I, you know, honestly that that probably would be a, a better video for the Action Film Cinema Kickstarter. If I ever do it again, I'll use that. Well, if you if you do if you do some some expansion book, you can you can do that particular gag. Just Excellent. absolutely, yeah. Just make just make sure to add inf inflict concept inflicted on this world by Mildred the Monk or something. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll definitely credit you. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I if I can have any input, just put in a quote for me saying, "I'm not sorry." <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah, something like that. So, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Ooh. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. So, uh, I, I've had the fortune to, to tell this story multiple times, uh, so I've kind of got it down to a science, but I will say with 100% certainty that I'm not 100% certain this is the truth, but this has become my truth. I started playing, I think, roughly when I was 12 years old. I have that sort of memory where or it happened when I was 12 or it happened two weeks ago. There is no other time frame, right? If I was a kid, it was around when I was 12. So I might have been eight. I might have been 14. But I think it was when I was around 12 years old. Me and my best friend in the world, still my best friend to this day, uh, we, I was from a very small town in rural Kentucky. We didn't even have a bookstore in our hometown that wasn't a Christian Bible bookstore. So his mom drove us to the next town over, and uh, they had a little small bookstore there. And we're just you know, I've all, I had always been into like fantasy stories and, and, and I was big into reading, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's my best friend who's like, hey, I want to buy this D&D thing. And it was the Mincer Red Box. I had no idea what D&D was, but he's my best friend. He wants to buy. He's like, I don't have enough money. Will you, you know, throw in with me so we can buy this game? And I'm like, I don't know what it is, but you're my best friend. So, of course. So we, I throw in half. He throws in half. I think it was like 20 bucks. This was, again, mm -hmm. would have been like 1987, roughly. Mm -hmm. Um so it was like 10 bucks each, something like that. So I don't know. So we get the red box. His mom is driving us home. He opens up the red box. And if you remember, if anybody out there listening remembers the old red box, it had multiple booklets. And one booklet was the GM side and one booklet was like the player's side. I don't know to this day if it was intentional or just this, but he handed me the GM book as he started reading the player's book. And I've been running games ever since. Yeah. Um. Since we're talking 1987, I'm guessing that would be Beck Me. Okay. Oh. Well, it's, there's mul there's multiple fir there's multiple first edition D um D and Ds. There's the, there's a different yes. edits of the original. There's the, there's blue there's blue box. There's BX the, and there's um Beck Me. BX and Beck Me are the ones I t hear the most as people's introduction when it comes to D and D. Um, 
Somet sometimes, if I'm lucky, it's white box. But keyword here is if I'm lucky. That would not be me. Yeah, because I believe uh, it was a very short period of time from when we went to play in the red box to play in first edition AD and D. So I think it was already out. Uh, By eighty-seven, it out. yeah, it was out. Um, yeah, uh, but we didn't know about it. But once we start playing D and D. Uh, gamers kind of start to sniff each other out, you know? So it's like a game recognized game. So while we were secluded in our gamesmanship and we didn't share with anybody because, you know, satanic panic, all that kind of good stuff, uh, we started noticing other people who just sort of like would look at us like, you know, like the high sign in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, a friend of ours is like, hey, in D&D &D now, and he handed us the uh, the the first edition books and we illegally made photocopies at the school library. Uh, and that's how we got our first AD and D books. Yeah. And as you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And, um, if we're talking AD and D first, yeah, that would, that would have long since, but by 87, it was, um, I think, I think second edition had already been out for a few years by that point. But yeah, I, I know we went to second edition. It's because my my progression was very quick through basic first and then to second. But I think I actually bought the second edition books. I think I actually found a place and that sold them because I was in immediately. I got again. I completely was just in love with the idea of the game, running the game. So I, this this became my life, as you might imagine, as I'm now into my late forties and I have multiple podcasts. I've I run a convention and I've just written my first RPG. I've never Ever stopped playing these games. Yeah, and I'm gi given given the nature of Action Twelve. I'm guessing that you were some were somebody who jumped around a fair bit when it came to set when it came to setting when it came to settings and when it came to mechanics. Uh, yeah, I was a lot more adventurous than my players. <laughs> I can actually a lot of like our early. Uh, hiccups and roadblocks is that I was constantly wanting to change rules or add in rules or change systems because there was a, there would be an element to the game that just didn't work for me. And my players got so frustrated and fed up because I was like, well, let's try this game because I think it might do this one thing better or let's try this thing because it might do this better. And they just like, we, we like the game we're playing. Can we just keep playing that game? Uh, so I started doing a lot more hacking Oh, I would say we're playing D&D, &D, but I would bring in these other rules or these ideas or make up my own, which, again, I think almost anybody who's played long enough has done that. Yeah. I was definitely much more willing to jump around, and, and I was also the one that bought all the games. Like, I would go to the bookstore, and I would buy this the Forgotten Realms box set. I'd buy this new game. I bought, bought GURPS. I bought DC Heroes. I bought Marvel Super Heroes. Uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, which I think was Palladium originally. Yeah, it was so Palladium. Like, yeah, so I had all of those games— and wanted to steal and pick and choose, but my players were like, let's just play D&D. &D. That's the one we know. That's the one we like. But the the one we played probably the most other than D&D &D was the old Marvel face rip game, mm -hmm. which I still love. I still run that game at conventions because it's not a great system, but I love it so much. Those were the two that really stuck with my group. D&D &D of whatever edition we were playing and then the Marvel face rip game. Mm -hmm. And... Um I I've done a I've done a few retrospectives here and there on Marvel and DC's relationship when it comes to TTRPGs. Um, between the two, Mar I'd say Marvel has the more interesting one with it, with its ups and downs. because <laughs> uh, you had you had the two attempts that TSR did the obvi obviously Marvel face obviously Marvel face rip though the fir the um the very first. "Quote unquote core book with Marvel face rip was one example of a bad habit that TSR had. Of do we actually need to put character creation in our core book? I mean, we didn't for Indiana Jones. And well, there's a reason why nobody likes the TSR Indiana Jones <laughs> because it had that exact problem. It is both both cases assumed that you would only want to play as the established characters, right?" In the case of Indiana Jones, that's well the cast of the films, and in the case of um, the fir the first iteration of Marvel Face Rip, it was well the characters in Marvel Comics. They then the adv then the advanced book came out that um, quickly amended that problem, 
but in the process of doing that, I ended up finding out about the time that they tried to go that um Marvel tried to make their own and go diceless with it, and then acted surprised when it when it wasn't being able to it wasn't able to compete with Dungeons and Dragons like they thought it would. That being Marvel Universe, which came out in two thousand one, ish. All right, I wanted to admit I am not familiar with this at all. This is all new to me. I didn't know that Marvel tried their own diceless version. I'm going to have to do some research because that sounds wild. I've done a re- I did a review of it a few years ago, and um, send me that link. I will definitely watch your list yeah, of that. I I had said it's an all it's an all right system in the wrong in the wrong context, and. What was really funny to me was that Mar- was that uh, Marvel thought that this would compete with Dungeons and Dragons. Keep in mind that this w- that this was shortly after Third Edition had come out. Well, okay, I have to say though, if if you were just to tell me, hey, here's a game that's based off of one of the top two comic book companies. Here's a game based off of a a maglamation bastardization of Tolkien fantasy with some mythology thrown in. I'm going to lean comics too, like not know anything about D and D just from like a completely outsider. I can see where they would think that they would have a leg up, maybe not fully understanding the marketplace, but I, that's one thing. I mean, like sometimes people make really dumb decisions. Don't get me wrong, myself included, but I can kind of see someone at Marvel going, Oh, we've got this in the bag, you know, Sure, of course we're going to be more popular. We have the entire Marvel Comics line behind us. Why wouldn't you want to play in that? This is uh, one of those cases where I love using the phrase "the devil is in the details" because mm. there's there were a few things that that um really that really worked against them. One, this was right around the time where there was that massive slap fight during Marvel's bankruptcy, mm. where you you essentially had a three you essentially had a three way fight between. Um, Perlman, um, aka the Wizard of the '80s, um, Ike Perlmutter, and I think there was there was one other one other part one other party a specific a particularly infamous corporate raider to the point that he served as the inspiration for Gordon Gecko in the film Wall Street. Wow. But. And and the whole time, all three all three of them were fi- were fighting over how the how Marvel's bankruptcy was going to get resolved and who actually had ownership of um, Marvel. And it got even more complicated when Perlmutter came in a- as he was the owner of Toy Biz, which is why you saw Toy Biz um, stuff all over the place in the nineties. Mm-hmm. But the other problem was going diceless. This is one of those things that I'm. I'm pretty sure their mindset on paper was a lot of comic book fans probably won't probably won't have dice. The problem is, diceless games are a bit of are a bit of a hard sell. People like their math rocks. They like the clickety clacks. Yeah, people people are dice goblins. No matter no matter how much they want to claim otherwise. And that's not that's not to say that you can't that you can't do a diceless game. It's just that. There's gonna there's gonna be a bit of a, a ceiling involved, uh, which is why you which is why you don't which is why you don't see all that many diceless games, uh, in general. Which I, I which I am fully aware of the irony given that I given that I've covered at least one on this channel, but well yeah, but I'm sure if you line up all the RPGs and you know diceless on one side and dice on the other it's not even going to be close to the number they got a total, dice. a total of 12 diceless games as opposed to hundreds upon hundreds of yep. games that use dice yeah I, I think the same philosophy of you know people may not want to buy dice similar to why we have so many games that use d6s only i think the theory is well anybody who has the set of monopoly has D6s. They don't have to go to a game store to buy the others. And that's why I'm against those because I hate rolling D6s. I think I think 2D6 is the dumbest possible resolution mechanic in the history of the world. It it works, but just turn them into D12s. Like every power by the apocalypse game would be immediately and instantly better if you said roll 2D12 instead of 2D6s. Yeah, that that's the other thing I was going I was going to ask about is 
you're by calling it Action 12 Cinema, you're putting front and center that this is using D12s. Yes. You have 12-sided dice on the friggin' cover, for God's oh. sakes. And one of the things I was going to be curious about is, wh is why D12, and you, can you kind of answered that. And I, since you dro brought up Power <laughs> by the Apocalypse, I was getting those vibes with it, especially with the way you handle attributes. Yeah, there is definitely some power by the apocalypse uh, DNA in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I, I say this in all sincerity. It's not a bit. I love rolling D12s. I think the D12 is the best polyhedral to roll at the table. I think it's the most fun to roll. Mm -hmm. I think it's just got good heft. It's got good roll. It, it, it's satisfying as it comes tumbling out the table or out of a dice tray, whatever the case may be. I think D6s are one of, if not the worst, die to roll at the table. They're just boring. So I legitimately, when I run Powered by the Apocalypse games, I use D12s instead. It's not very hard. It isn't it's just a straight double everything. The math is slightly different than that, but you can very easily convert sixes, 2D12s, and run Powered by the Apocalypse. It works exactly the same, yep. immediately better. So, yes, absolutely, D12s are better. But there is, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't like Powered by the Apocalypse games. I don't like rolling 2D6s for resolution. Yeah, I... Um... I don't I don't mind two I don't mind 2D6, but it's a case of it's got it's got to be at the right place and for for me if you if you're going to if you're going to have a 2D6 mechanic at least get at least give me something so th so that if I get so that if I get um sets that matters mm. you like know, get, uh, fantasy age or the dragon age systems that's what that's that's one example um of get of making the, making these sets matter because something something that I'm very big on is making the actual di making the actual die result matter. Not ha not having it so that if you if you roll a five or a, if you succeed with a five or succeed with a six, then you're still succeed you're still succeeding. Um, if you're doing if you're doing that kind of pool setup, um, mm -hmm. I was even though it's using d tens, I was a real big fan of of the um of the way the way weapons of the gods and legends of the Wulin handle their die pool, because it's not it's not aim high or aim low or or anything like that. It's roll it. It's you're aiming for sets. Uh, essentially, essentially the ten the you get a double digit number. The ten is the number of die in that set, and the one is the facing of those die. And there's there's sep there's separate mechanics for each, and this would be swingy, except for mm -hmm. a mechanic it has called River, where you can bank die that you're not using. Gotcha. Uh, just, I'm not familiar with that, but that sounds very interesting. Yeah, it. There's some editing problems when it comes to Legends of the Wulin, which a friend of the show, um, Joel Clark, is att is attempting to fix in his own way with Lone Wolf Fists, but. The fa but there's in but there's interesting things that you can do with that with that setup and as far as D12s one of the bit one of the big instances that I've covered on this channel of using them is um, Blade of the Iron Throne and its spiritual predecessor Riddle of Steel which were which were fantasy they were um, sword and sorcery style games that placed a lot of emphasis. On the action pool that you would get from me from melee combat, uh, and R Riddle of Steel. Well, that was that was that was that in particular was endorsed by a group at no at the time as the Renaissance Martial Arts Association. Okay. So that's ki that's kind of the vibe it's going for. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a bit obvious with with a name like Riddle of Steel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But now, when it comes to when it comes to how you're using um, action, tw you're using the twelve sided dice with action twelve. Is that as I as I understand it, um, you're it's a case of rolling d tw case of rolling d twelves, and you're looking for either a one a one an eight to eleven or a twelve. Everything else is tossed. Pretty much, yeah. And um, again, the game is 
first engineered to try to get you to roll a handful of D12s. Mm-hmm. And through various play testing, I found that five D12s just seemed to be the most satisfying. It just feels best to me. It's a hunking handful of D12s, but it's not so many that it's hard to like the gate. Uh, so again, the, the whole dice mechanic was retro in, or, ba- or backwards in, engineered th- to get you to roll five almost every time, mm-hmm. uh, which is why the the attributes kind of look like Power by the Apocalypse is because those numbers zero, ones, and twos just made the most sense to to get a way to get you to get to to five. Uh, but yeah, basically ones are bad. Uh, there are setbacks; they count as negative one successes. Twos through sevens are blanks. They just don't affect the results at all. Eights through elevens are successes. They count as one success. And then twelves count as two successes. But they also do other things. You can either just hold on to them and roll them later on someone else's turn. It's the only time you can roll a die on someone else's turn is if you bank a D12. Or you can re-roll them right then and there so you technically have more than five. And if they get another 12, you can do that again. So there is no technical upper limit to successes. Mathematically, you're going to hit three about every turn. like two to three is the average positive result. With setbacks, you could end up getting a negative result. Sometimes you can end up where all the positives and negatives blank each other and you end up with a just net neutral also that technically you have no positives or negatives the dice. Uh, but one of the rules of the game, not that you asked this specifically, but I'll say it here, is that nothing never happens. Mm-hmm. Roll the dice and you end up with just nothing. Like everything's twos and sevens or, you know, enough twelves and ones. They all balance each other out. Uh, you get to do the villainous cutscene where we actually jump over and you get to kind of narrate what the bad guys are up to. Mm-hmm. So this could be the people you're fighting from their point of view. It could be within the mastermind's layer to give a little bit more detail to what their plan is or how they are reacting to the players, you know, interfering in their schemes. So you get to really kind of ham it up as the bad guy a little bit. So if you do end up rolling something that's just kind of like the, it actually becomes a fun thing because you get to do this really rare uh, c- cutscene because you know you can go an entire two or three games and never get those, mm-hmm. uh, but when it does happen, so it becomes a cool thing for nothing to happen. If that makes sense. Yeah. Now, you admit now the way I see the way I see it, it mentions you start with one and we'll add you'll add more based on how you're trying to overcome. What would be the most common ways that a player would add d12s? So you have. Um, Two ways that I, I suggest that everyone always use, that is you're going to choose your attribute that you're going to use as your, the way you're describing what you're doing will kind of help you determine which attribute. The attributes are brains, brawn, charm, and moxie. Mm-hmm. So brains is being smart, being able to figure things out. Uh, brawn is how strong you are, also just how tough you are. Charm is like social graces, emotional IQ, manipulation, persuasion. And then moxie is really anything else. It's also sort of like luck or chutzpah. There's something that just doesn't make sense. Like, I don't, I don't know how ever else to explain what I'm doing here. It's probably moxie Mm -hmm. and that's rated zero, one, one, or two. You, you pick when you make your character. So if your brains is a plus two and you're doing something that you can justify that I'm using my brains to do this, then you would add two D12s to the dice pool. You have five slots for skills which are rated at plus two, three are rated at plus one. You can create as many of these as you want at character creation. I suggest you leave a few open and you can create them in the moment as you need them. But these can be very oddly applicable. So like sometimes I'll just put like super fight. If I'm playing in a game and I'm doing anything that revolves around fighting, super fight skill can work. You could put ninjutsu. So anything you're using weapons or unarmed fighting, it would count. Or you could put like underwater basket weaving. And then the the object is, well, how can I find a way to make sure that that skill actually makes sense enough that it becomes useful in the, in the game? This is a very silly game if that has not come across yet. So like it's absolutely designed to be silly. Uh, um, you, and you so, put B movie action in the title. I th- yeah, you're getting what you pay for. Hopefully, people get that. Um, so if you if you're just trying to min max and, and you really can't min max this game, like so I don't want anyone ever feel like, well, if I'm always using my best up. No, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. So you start with one, 
you use your plus two attribute and you use one of your plus two skills, you're at five dice. That's the most you can roll. So you're pretty much done. You could, you're just got your five, you're going to roll them and you're going to result your dice pool. If you, for whatever reason, aren't using what you're best at, because sometimes it's fun not to, or there might be some narrative reason why you can't, then you can also leverage your relationship. You create at least one of these at character creation. You can create more and you can create more or evolve them as the game goes on. Um, you can leverage a relationship in one of two ways. It could be the, you're actually in the scene with me. So like we're both fighting the bad guy and like, Hey, you go high, I'll go low. You can leverage a relationship. So you get enough, another plus one uh, D 12, mm -hmm. or it can be like an emotional thing. Like I can't let my daughter down. Damn it. I'm going to make her recital this time. Um, so that kind of gives you like an emotional push to fight your way through whatever's causing you to not make the recital. You can get a plus one that way. Uh, there's also a tropes mechanic. So you at the beginning of the game have the chance to create a list of tropes that you can actually leverage for additional die. You can use tropes all the time and you should if it's a bad action movie or a, mm -hmm. I, I like to say a bad but fun action movie. You should be using tropes all the time, but you'll have a specific list of ones that you can say, okay, because I'm not going to look at this explosion, I get a plus one. Or we're doing a kitchen chase scene, so I get a plus one here. So you've got a bunch of different ways to get your dice pull up to five, if you're not, even if you're not always using your best attribute and your best skill. Yeah. Um, I suppose. I suppose a trope. I suppose an example of a trope in this case would be it would be um. Expl would be ex would be explode exploding cu exploding cups and 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 plates if if the if you're doing say a reenaction of the tea house shootout from hard boiled <laughs> yes oh. that would definitely fit uh, and, you know if you can go online and there's literally hundreds if not thousands of tropes that you can pull from I have like 200 and something I've I put in the book that already tells you what they are but I, I think if you watch a lot of action movies at least half of them you're going to know just by the title alone there might be a few that you're not exactly sure what you're going for there but again I've, I've listed a bunch in the books or you can go online and get even more uh, but everything that you've ever seen in a bad action movie is you know, that's what we want. We want those sorts of things because it's a bad but fun action movie. So we, we want you to use as many as you can, mm -hmm. but we give you a defined list of these are the specific ones you can actually use to get a bonus yeah. in this in the role here. Are you familiar with the book Blowing Up the Movies? No. Uh, that is that actually that actually would be a interesting compa interesting companion to um, Action Twelve Cinema. Okay. Uh, the now the book itself is by is by Rob is by Robin Laws, who's the same madman behind the Feng Shui games. Who I I've played that game. It definitely was part of the inspiration as well. Yeah. But it's it was basically a collection of essays to um to add it to add in to add in um action elements into TTRPGs is the be is the best way to put it um it was it was designed as a companion to feng shui 2 as part of its kickstarter but okay. you can get you can get the thing on its own uh, and it 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 talks about a lot of different films and how you can take some of the action stuff within it and implement it within your games Definitely need to get this book. Yeah, absolutely. It'll it'll be probably here in a couple of days. That sounds amazing. Yeah, and you should be able to get it relatively inexpensive. It's not that thick of a book. Yeah. But, it. Yeah. But for for drawing i for drawing ideas, it's especially for this kind of game, it's invaluable. Um, I've I've oh good sorry good. What I do find interesting with the approach you're taking is unlike say Powered by the Apocalypse, which. I'm gonna be making comparisons too, so so, so sorry in advance. Sorry in nope. advance. Um, it's a fair comparison. Instead of your instead of attributes, skills, and the like, modifying the modifying the die result, you have it where you're adding more die, which certainly appeals to the dice goblin in me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rolling dice are fun, and I'd say I'd say in doing so, it also. It also means that you can't that you can't be safe. 
Like some somebody, if they've got a good amount of bonuses in a in PBTA or or similar games where it's all about one set of die and then static modifiers, there's a degree of safety you have with rolls. Whereas with this one, because you're not modifying any of the die results, at, le at least when it comes to the facings, every si every single die roll is a risk. So it, it is, um, in a way. So, again, I think that's kind of a, a very interesting point, if you don't mind, let me explain it a little bit, mm -hmm. that because there's no actual hit points in the game, you, you are playing an action movie hero, you're going to survive because that's what action movie heroes do. They are going to win. They are going to to overcome at the end of the movie. That is just an, uh, a a set expectation of this type of game. So whenever you have a bad roll, that does is make things more complicated. It adds drama. Hopefully it adds tension, makes it more fun. So I didn't see any need to make the misses to the die because you're all the math is already so much in your favor. Be successful. Like the average result is a positive two to, to positive three, so it's like two point five or two point six when I when I ran the calculations at the final time and I, when I set everything in stone. So you're going to succeed almost all the time. So when you do occasionally have a bad roll, all that does is make things more interesting. It makes them more dramatic. Again, hopefully add some tension. So I didn't see there to be any need to like give a plus one or a plus two. And there are some ways to modify dice results as far as like if you don't like the results you can re-roll there's a re-roll mechanic but there is nothing in the game that says okay you get plus two to one of your die you just get to re-roll them or you get to roll more dice because i think rolling more dice is fun but it's already so heavily weighted in the success factor uh that i didn't feel any i don't i don't think it added anything to give you a specific thing that said okay because you're doing this you get to add two to all your results or you get to have a special die that gets plus two to it that that didn't seem necessary and hopefully people who play the game will agree yeah and when it now when it comes when it comes to things like things like skills relationships um pers personal crisis the and uh, the heroic trait and the achilles heel um mm -hmm. Because of the as I'm looking at these on the character sheet you had sent me, um, what these give me the vibe of is descriptors. And one thing one thing that I'm curious about, because I've seen I've seen some other games fall into this trap, is within the core book for Action Twelve, are you planning on putting in a guide for what for what makes a what makes a good or questionable entry for skills, relationships, and so on? Yeah, there is a currently there's a list of like examples that have come up from the play test that I particularly liked. Um, and I'm probably I'm thinking about adding in a, a D12 table because the, the beginning of the book is nothing but D12 tables for if you have someone who just doesn't want to come up with one, like roll D12 and we'll give you one mm -hmm. uh, just to make it a little bit simpler and easier. All these are are role playing prompts. There's a very little there's a bit of a mechanical effect that you can use them for, but mostly they're just for you as the player to help sort of define who your character is in your head that when it comes time to role play or story tell through their point of view, you have a better idea of who this person is. Yeah. Um, the big reason I point out the whole, the whole advice, the whole advice thing on what we what would be a good or bad entry for each is experiences with, um, with fate. Mm -hmm. Because, there's definitely some fate DNA in this game as well. Yeah, I, I can certainly see it. And um, to a certain extent, fate has been my whipping boy for this particular problem because of how it handles aspects. Specifically the fact that this particular blank check that you're giving to the players and GMs does not... The, the fate core book does not give a whole lot of advice as to what makes a good or a bad aspect and since it's one of the one of the pillars of how the fate system works that's a bit of a problem for me mm -hmm. um, now I, I will point out that there are some exceptions that use the fate system that don't have this problem like say Tiansha uh, where it actually does ha actually does have a example set up plus it's integrated into its martial arts system but I usually put games like that into a bubble and put it off in the corner. <laughs> when it 
core doesn't have that issue, uh, or do, does ha does have this particular issue, and it's mm -hmm. it's something I always bring up when it comes to games that have that blank check, which is what that kind of thing is. Uh, although I'm when it comes to heroic trait and, and Achilles heel, um, those are the ones I'm most curious about with this blank check as to what. What would you say would be the dividing line between a skill and a heroic trait, for instance? So for me, a, a trait is just something that's inherent about that person that makes them heroic, like a sense of duty and honor, a vow they won't break, uh, you know, an overriding sense of justice and fairness versus I've trained 12 years in a monastery and I can punch through steel. Mm -hmm. So a skill to me would be that it's a, it's a learned trait over time. You've, you've spent effort trying to develop it, whether it's like hacking in a spaceship, hot wiring cars, or, you know, martial arts versus I just have an innate sense of right and wrong. And I, I will never violate that. That might be a heroic trait. Mm -hmm. So the, now taking, now taking that into account, taking that into account, um, when it came to when it came to Achilles' heel, is that something that the player can say, can declare that they're invoking? Yes. So most things that you try to I, I use the word leverage a lot. So you leverage this skill, you leverage this relationship. Uh, but invo invoking is absolutely an accurate term. It's, it puts it more in the realm of fate, but they're very similar. So leverage is just my way of trying to differentiate a little bit. Mm -hmm. But usually you do that. So you you're leveraging, or, you know, you're you're going to leverage the skill so you get a, an extra die. You're going to leverage this relationship to get an extra die. Mm -hmm. If you want to um, you roll. You can use your heroic trait to do so. So you roll your dice and you just don't like the result. So you, the ones you have to keep. So if you rolled two ones, you have to keep those, but you're going to re-roll any of the other dice, even if they were successes. Maybe you had an eight, which technically is a success, but you're hoping maybe you'll get a 12. So you're going to re-roll the three. You invoke your heroic trait and you say, well, I have this innate sense of justice. And this to me feels like if I failed here, I would be myself down or I'd be letting this other person down that's counting on me. So I, I think my character should probably prevail here and I want to try to I want to try to make that happen. So you can narrate it as first attempt never happened and this new result is just what always was or you could narrate it as you know as the moment was about to pass me up in a fleeting last ditch effort I was then able to succeed you you can sort of interpret the dice however you feel is appropriate within the narration of your turn the achilles heel you say before I even roll achilles heel is coming into play and usually it's something that can get you into trouble. And, and often it can even be your same as your heroic trait. Like I, I mentioned that in the book, like you could say your heroic trait is that you never give up. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you should give up because there are times when not giving up puts you and other people in danger because you should run away here. You could say, well, I never give up. So I'm going to stay and fight even though there's overwhelming odds. And when that happens, you get to add two dice to your dice pool. And this is the only time you can go above five. So when you invoke your Achilles heel or whenever you leverage your Achilles heel, you can say, I'm going to roll up to seven dice. But if you roll any ones, they count as negative two. So it's a very big risk versus reward because you could get three twelves, get a whole bunch of successes and just maybe in the obstacle, maybe in the act, take out the bad guy. But if this goes poorly, there's a really good chance you're not going to have enough other successes to be able to overcome that, and you're probably going to end up with a net negative result. Yeah. Now, speaking of results, I'm curious if in the book anywhere you have a um, result ladder of sorts, kind of like kind of like the skill ladder that was in Fate, where it get where it gives kind of the degree of success or failure on the, with the total. It, there isn't because that. I'm familiar with that ladder. It it doesn't really translate to this game, uh, at least not in a one to one sort of ratio, because it's a GMless game. If we didn't say that already, already it's a GMless game, so there is no GM. Everybody's taking turns, is what I call the active player. The active player, whatever you say happens, happens. Like you can just describe it. You know, again, 
thing about the martial arts, you could have yourself just describing how you are taking on five different nameless ninja foes, and it can be the most John Wick over the top gung fu, or it can just be like Rocky, you pound them to sand, whatever you want to describe. End of your turn, if you say, I've knocked out five ninja, those five ninja are unconscious. There is no die roll that tells you if that was successful or not. Mm -hmm. The dice only tell you if what you had said happened, which did happen, helped or not. So that is where you have to interpret the dice. So if you roll really well, then not only did you take out those five foes, there might have been three others who are like, oh, wow, we are over... This is, this is too much for us, so maybe three of them run away, and now you have less to fight overall. If you rolled really poorly, you didn't realize these were the three mooks that you were sent to distract you, and the whole time you were fighting them, this other thing over here is happening. And so even though those five are unconscious, you're in a worse position than you thought, and you're in a worse position than you were. So there's only basically four, you know, there's three results, net negative, net neutral, or positive. Until you actually overcome an obstacle, which is where you have enough positives to com complete it, which usually happens over successive turns, um, you only have to worry about, did you fail a net neutral or did you have any sort of positives? Uh, it, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that ma that makes sense. Um, I think I think the reason I was asking is j is just to see the dividing line between getting between getting one success or getting t or getting multiple ones cuz i'm guessing that you that in order for it to succeed you just need one everything else is just a bonus so not exactly um so essentially everything is abstracted like like the whole game is just an abstraction of a bad action movie so everything is like uh, like you'll have an obstacle in the game you have to overcome and the obstacle might be quicksand or it might be fight or it might be something is lost or something must be found or a mystery to be solved. Like it's it's basically every action movie you've ever watched, if you tried to abstract all the problems that they're facing, that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to take it back to its base form so that you can interpret it however you need to for the movie basically that you're that you're telling. Your chase may look very different than my chase in this movie, and your fight may look very different than my fight in this other movie. But every obstacle, I'm, I'll put an asterisk on there, almost every ob uh, obstacle comes in with 12 points. I have a great name for it right now. I'll just call them complication points. Mm -hmm. And as you get successes, you subtract those points. So if on your turn, you got three successes. Well, now that obstacle has nine successes that you need to get before it will be cleared. And then the next player would go and maybe they get two and now you need seven. And the next person goes and they get three. Now you need four. Next person goes and they roll terribly and they roll so bad they have a net negative success. We've added points back. So it's, it's gone back up now. Um, and that's basically how the successes. So more successes do matter. Only that means you're getting closer to completing that act or that yeah. obstacle, sorry, which might end the act. In that regard, would it be not that far removed from the clock system that's that you see in PBTA or in um, or in any, any Forged in the Dark project? So, hundred percent yes. But I always like to point out that all a clock system is is a skill challenge from Fourth Edition D and D with a different skin. Oh, on it. they oh they hate it, and I and I applaud you for doing that. <laughs> yep. I love skill challenges. I think skill challenges in fourth edition is one of the best mechanics ever created. It was just very poorly explained um, and it wasn't implemented very well. But I use skill challenges all the time in fifth edition. It's one of my favorite things to do. hundred yeah. percent. That is what my game is. It is one long skill challenge in a completely different. It's yeah. just the, the, the skin on it looks different, but that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I, ju I just like it. I just like giving people shit about how, about how, um, about the, about the issues that some folk had with with fourth edition, and and how some of the some of the issues were not as not as issue ish as as they like as they like to think. Plus, I, plus I like to rub salt. I like to rub salt in the wounds. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of a contrarian that way as well. Like I I really liked fourth edition for quite a while, but the more I played it, the less I liked it. But there are absolutely things about that game that just work. I mean, absolutely. And, and to this day, 5th edition is super easy to teach because usually I will start with pre-gens and I just kind of explain the rules as I go. 
But if I'm actually trying to explain to someone how the game works, not just get them playing, but like explain how it works, I can teach someone how to play fourth edition in 15 minutes. I still need a good hour to get fifth edition and actually explain all the different pieces and parts versus, okay, you just need to roll a D20. I will tell you what that means, but versus I'm going to tell you what, why you're rolling this and what it means. Fourth edition is the easiest version of D&D ever to teach, in my opinion. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly hurt. One, one particular instance of, of me kind of rubbing salt in this way was um, when Wizards made that whole announcement about how they were getting rid of negative modifiers for races. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you want a cookie? Because you, you already did this back in 2008. Because they, because that was that was one of the big things they did with races from third to fourth. They got rid of the neg, they got rid of the positive negative modifier um, dichotomy, and the reason they got rid of it was because it was getting harder and harder to justify it. And and it still isn't implemented correctly, and that still bothers me a little bit. Like I, this is a complete tangent, but like elves are supposed to be some of the most graceful live creatures in the world and whatever version of D you want to play but you know definitely from like tolkien-esque lore so the most graceful elf be an unattainable unattainable level of grace for a human or for a dwarf i don't think it should be elves get plus two to dexterity i think it should be other creature an 18 in dexterity only elves can and dwarves should only be able to get 20s in constitution. No other no other can. Uh, I know, I, I think species is the better term. I still use race sometimes interchangeably. But uh, to me, that actually models what the narrative, narrative is. No human will ever be as graceful as an elf. Give it where that humans can't get to that level outside of magical means, rather than saying all elves get a plus two. But I can still get a human that has a plus two or dexterity if I want to. I just got to get there differently. And to me, that that breaks the whole point of what the narrative is telling me. I still, yeah, I have, I have issues with all the ways they've done it, to be honest with you. And the the thing I, the thing I find funny is, um, well, the, pe- the people who had, one of the people who was involved with 4th edition, well, came, came up with a better solution in um, 13th Age. Yep, I love 13th Age. Great. You get a mo- you get a modifier from your race. You get a modifier f- and a positive modifier from your class. You can't double up. Yep. Simple. <laughs> yep. Before- I think again, Thirteenth Age is a great game. I think more yeah. people should play it, and I'm very excited about the second edition. Yeah, I've I've looked at a few things. I can't I can't go into detail just yet. Um, but there's some interesting things and some things I don't exactly agree with, but I can deal because mm. right. um, the Lord made house ruling for a reason. <laughs> yep, exactly. Hundred percent. If I don't, if I don't like, and rule zero exists, so if I don't like a rule, I will change it. I agree with that. But <clears throat> what prompted you to go GMless? Because that's a bold move. So, a couple different things. So, because the game didn't start off as being GMless, it it started off as a as a traditional GM game, but it absolutely also started as a as a joke, like a literal. This is just this thing I'm doing for fun. Uh, it it's the the original name of my game was called Michael's ridiculously and unnecessarily overly complicated rules light RPG, uh, and that was the name I started with because it was it was a stupid thing I did as as like a gag on some of my friends. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make them roll like ten d12. It was just like, how many d12 can I get them to roll and still make it an RPG? And for the first three or four games. Like there was no game here. It wasn't ever like I'm going to create a game. It was just like I'm going to do this stupid. Thing. I run a convention, so I had years. I had opportunity, so I'm like, hey, I'm going to run this game. And people are like, cool, I'll, I'll play it. And then they just rolled a bunch of d12s, and it was stupid. But what kept happening is people would go, this "Is way too overly complicated." Because that was the joke. Is it was a rules like game that was so overly complicated, but it was actually fun. And I kept getting people say that was over complicated, but I did have fun. And so after the joke kind of started to wear off, I'm like, there's actually something here. And I kind of, I started cutting back all the stuff that was thrown in just to make it ridiculously and unnecessarily overcomplicated. And I got to the point where it was like a pretty smooth engine of improv prompts 
in D12s. And then the final piece of the puzzle was the movie thing. Because I've been a big movie watcher my whole life. I grew up watching really bad B movies or one of my favorite, you know, guilty pleasures. And that was what finally clicked it into place is, okay, this is a B movie improv prompt simulator. And then all the D12s are there is to kind of help, you know, so you have a little bit of mechanical Wait, you get to the couple of choices you can make that impact the character's decisions. And, you know, you can reroll this or you can add that. Making it GMless, I think, is actually what makes it really hum as a as an bit, as a as an activity. So as someone who's probably played traditional D and I assume at some point either you as the DM or the DM to you has you've had that moment where you kill a monster and the DM goes, Okay, what does it look like when you kill this monster? And for that brief little moment, you have complete narrative control. So the dice may have said, I hit, I stabbed this ogre with my short sword, and that's why it died. You can describe that however you want. Like you could describe it that you missed with your sword. The ogre tried to hit you, became unbalanced, and toppled over and fell off the cliff. As long as the ogre is still dead at the end of your description, it doesn't really matter how you describe it. At least that's how I play it. Mm -hmm. And that's what this game, it is that moment. It is the, what does this look like to you moment made into an entire game. And when you have that, you don't need a GM. Yeah. <clears throat> now, when, now, um, I want to talk a bit about the personal crisis part of characters. Okay. Oh, because because on, on the sheet it says try to try and resolve by end of movie. Um, now I can I can get the idea of it. What I'm curious about is what the reward is for resolving the personal crisis, or at least making progress to resolving it, especially with the numbers thing you've got on the side. Yeah, it is only a role play prompt. It is, and it, I, I do cover in this book. It is completely optional. You do not have to engage with this at all. If you don't think this is fun, ignore it. But the way it works mechanically, and this, again, it's a, it's a trope of action movies where your hero is going through something in their everyday life. Their kids don't respect them. Their wife or husband is about to leave them. They, they don't have the job that they want. They're too afraid to ask their boss for a promotion. Whatever the case may be, they've got something going on in their real life. The, the events in the movie them an opportunity to address both you know something about the movie they they finally have to stand up for themselves it's the terrorists and so then asking for their job or asking their boss for a raise is now becomes inconsequential right mm -hmm. or their wife doesn't think that they love them but they they risk their life to save their loved one you know spouse whatever husband wife doesn't matter and shows that person that i do care about you and it strengthens their marriage that is what this is. It is playing to the trope that a hero, action hero movies, everyday life is generally a mess. And whatever happens in the movie gives them an opportunity to work on that. Mm -hmm. So if you want, totally optional, you can create a personal crisis for your character at character creation. And then anytime you build a dice pool, if you voluntarily pull one die out, you roll, you still have any successes counts as a tick towards your personal crisis. Mm -hmm. You do that three times over the course of the game. You can say, just as you're narrating the end of the movie for your character, you can narrate how you've also been able to incorporate your personal crisis being resolved. Yeah. Personal crisis, because you're having to pull a die out, which is kind of technically a jerk move because you're making it less likely you'll succeed for the table because everyone's working together. It's a gameless game. You're all on the same team. Uh, so it's a bit selfish to say, okay, I'm going to try to wor work on my personal crisis here, so I'm going to pull out this D12. As long as you have any successes at all, it counts towards that personal crisis. You just got to do that three times. I suggest you do it once per act, but the way the game works, it's possible that you may not get a full opportunity in Act 1 because Act 1 only has one obstacle, and the way the math works, you could have someone just get like eight successes on their turn. It doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. Mm -hmm. So just in case that happens, there is no hard and fast rule. You have to do one per act, but that's that's the way it should work in an actual movie. Each each act, you'll see a little bit of improvement towards that. Yeah. Now, since we've used a lot of inferences when it comes to movies do you consider Action 12 to be a game that leans itself more towards one-shots 
or oh, hundred percent, yeah, yeah. It is it is absolutely designed for one shots. There is no campaign campaign component other than like you could string sessions together to make a franchise like Fast and the Furious or Star Wars or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no way for your characters to get better because they're already action movie heroes. They're already as good as they ever need to be. I could I could see some I could see swapping some things or some things around, but yeah, that's as far as I that's as far as I'd go with it. Um, now, when it comes to locations, I know you mentioned that tropes could be could be used to help enhance a die roll. Is there a similar mechanic with locations, or are locations just meant to be the sets that you're going to be flowing through in a given campaign? Yeah, so it's just kind of help because it is a gameless game. So it's just to kind of help everyone get an idea before the game starts of kind of the flow of the movie. Uh, originally, when I was doing the playtest, we would come up with, with a location per character. Generally, that's four or five. I found that most of them we never touched. Still can happen. It's part of the book. Like if you create a location and you never go there, that's totally fine. But to kind of minimize that, what I would call a little bit of a wasted effort, now I suggest you only create two locations. The starting location where the movie's inciting incident will kick out, kick off at the beginning of Act 1, or final location where the showdown will be. So that could be like in a volcano, Lost City of Atlantis, uh, on the edge of a neutron star, the villain's underground lair, you know, Godzilla's home, whatever the case may be. So you know where you're starting. We're starting at the Mall of America, and we're going to end a Soviet base. All right, so we all know where we're starting. We all know where we're going. So as we're each taking our turns... We know to kind of be building towards that, okay, well, we can't be in the mall for Act 1 and Act 2. You can, but it's harder. And then justify being in Antarctica at Act 3. So maybe at the act, end of Act 1, we need to be on a bus or a plane or a submarine. It makes sense that we are ending up where we need to go. So that's all that is. You're setting your starting point and your ending point, and in, it just helps build a roadmap so that you can all sort of push your way forward that direction as you're going. I would probably end up putting putting some sort of a side where one of the rules of fiction is that if you are shot, from, if a if an enemy is shot from a high place, they will fall to their death. <laughs> Look, so but, yeah, it's not but, yeah. Bullets may do you in, but gravity will not be denied its ritual sacrifice. I don't I, make. You know, the rules. I can't argue with that. <laughs> and they will also scream. You'll have a, ah, well off of the side. If if I can get my soundboard working and I'm running this. You can be damn sure I will use the Wilhelm scream at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's almost always referenced in the game, but to actually have it there would be would be a nice touch, I have to say. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of having a soundboard. Um, now one 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 particular um, one particular motif I'm cu I'm curious about that's all that was also in the on the um, sheet that you had sent me is. Um, obstacles. Mm -hmm. and I'm get. I'm guessing. I'm guessing this is the obstacle would be the quote the quote unquote ways to overcome that particular act. Yes. So there's one obstacle in Act One. That's your inciting incident. There's two obstacles in Act Two, and these could either be something that are running side by side, or one leads into the other. And then you have three obstacles in Act Three of which is the final confrontation with whoever the mastermind evil bad guy, bad thing, robots from the future, you from the past, whatever you're trying to face. Uh, in Act 1 and Act 2, all of them are coming at 12. Again, currently the name is Complication Points. I haven't come up with something better. I may not, but that's what they are right now. In Act 3, because you have three of them, two of them are only valued at 6, and the third one is valued at 12, but the two sixes act as like a defense mechanism. You can't actually interact with the third final one until you've gotten through both of the other two. Mm -hmm. well, act two and act three had the same mechanical weight, but they're a little bit different in how you can approach them. Because in act two, you can introduce them both at the same time if you want, and then you could interact with each one separately. So you could have a fight and a fire. Um, and you on your turn, you could say, okay, this I'm interacting with the fire. On your next turn, I'm interacting with a fight choose to bounce in between them but in the third act you cannot choose to interact with the third one until you've got rid of the first two mm -hmm. and these are all based on d12 charts uh, all the charts are inspirational only so if you roll something you don't like you can ignore it you can make up your own you can re-roll uh, it's just to kind of help 
you figure out what the sort of the basic outline of your movie would be. Uh, I've used this example before, but like um, one of the one of the play tests, we decided that we were going to do like a typical 80s action sort of movie. And then when we rolled our bad guy, we rolled for a wizard. We said, okay, well, rather than it being an actual wizard, we're just going to say that it's like this evil corporation called Wizard Corp. Mm -hmm. And the CEO just went by the nickname of the wizard. So that's kind of how we made it made sense. And in another one we did, uh, one of the obstacles was quicksand. Because you got to have quicksand. Like, it's just the, one of the most classic um, action movie tropes in the world. Mm -hmm. But it didn't make sense for the movie we were playing because we were playing against fey creatures who were shrinking cities uh, to get them out of the way so they could, like, come into our realm. So we interpreted quicksand to be that we were inside one of the skyscrapers that was being shrunk. And so we had to get out before it shrank to the point that we would be crushed. So, again, part of the fun of the game is to take these very broadly applicable prompts and figure out a way for them to make sense to the story that you are telling in the movie that you're creating. Yeah. And I, I can certainly get that. You did, you did mention a bunch of tables. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if within the, t within those particular tables, there's some, there's some guides for people who want to make a movie out of, um, completely on the fly. Uh, yeah, so actually what was the, the original version of the game, that's what you did, is that you didn't roll for an obstacle until it was time to introduce one. Uh, I now call that chaos mode. So you can still do that. Uh, you're going to get probably a lot more chaotic and nonsensical story. So the current direction is that you roll for all six obstacles at the beginning during what I call the pre-production phase. And that's when you roll for your bad guy, you roll for your plot, you create your characters, you decide your locations, all that stuff. And you decide the order that you will use the six obstacles. So you might have two fights. Fight comes up a lot because it's an action movie. So you're like, okay, we'll have a fight in act one. And then we'll, we'll have the final fight in act three. We have a quicksand. We'll put that in two. And so you can kind of start to build an outline of how you think the movie is going to flow. And, it just makes it make it a little bit more coherent, coherent sense uh, narratively as you move through the acts. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from just on it when you need it and figuring out, you know, whether, and even if it doesn't make sense, that's part of the joke. That's why it's, these are bad movies mm -hmm. that sometimes things don't make sense. And you're like, well, it's just a bad movie. So if you like, I can't hold an accent. I, I'm from Kentucky. I barely speak English. I cannot do an accent to save my life. If I decide to try, and halfway through Act Two, I'm no longer doing the Scottish accent. We'll be like, oh yeah, well we recast the actor. That's why I'm now doing more of an Irish accent because it's a different actor playing. I'm not because I can't hold an accent for more than an hour. <laughs> um, and there's also a rule in the game that like if if an act just stops being fun, you know, you're rolling really bad, you're having to add points back to obstacles, and you're like, I don't want to roll against this obstacle anymore. If everyone at the table agrees, you just end that obstacle or end that act. You're now in the next one, and it's just someone missed, had the wrong script. We, we were shooting out of order. No further explanation needed. Get get back to the fun part. Mm -hmm. And when you when you when you mentioned the when you mentioned the whole different actor thing, one of the first things that came to mind was the wig incident with Samurai Cop. Even though that wasn't a actor thing, but more of a why why that why he was wearing a why he was wearing a wig for what was supposed to be just a couple shots but it ended up being the whole movie so one of the worst not, again it's not a different actor but i don't know if you're are you familiar with the i think it's in the 90s the movie dragnet yes it was like tom hanks dan Aykroyd, and rosie o'donnell in it for some reason mm-hmm the very famous scene where rosie o'donnell is wearing some like leather sex dominatrix gear I had to go back and they had to reshoot a scene. Uh, two months had passed since the movie and she had worked out and got in shape. So she's, you know, this isn't fashion. I mean, she talks about this. She's like 20 pounds heavier, noticeably different in one scene than the other, right next to each other. Like mm -hmm. it is jarring to see it if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Oh. Um. And there's, a, there's, you look deep enough in any film, you'll always find those ki those kind of stories of people having to scram scramble f for certain things, or or some people not thinking things through. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite instance of that will always be the utter hell that was the RoboCop suit. 
because the suit itself weighs 85 pounds. It's a it's a mixture of um, it's a mixture of fiberglass and um, and cr and chrome with for a lot of the metal parts, along with a heavy amount of rubber for the black parts of it. Mm -hmm. That's bad enough. Now to make it worse, they br Peter Weller was brought in specifically because he was going to be skinnier than say Arnold, and they were filming in Dallas in the summer. Warm there. Inhuman. Because <laughs> this was the 80s and Dallas was on that futurism kick at the time. So it would be a natural fit. To make it even worse, um, he was supposed to be trained in mime. You know, so v very slow, deliberate movements mm -hmm. in an 85-pound suit in the hot Texas sun. It got to the point where he was losing he was losing like a pound a day before they put in this cooling area just for him so he could well live right yep but of course of course of course when it comes to things going wrong i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure you could have jackie chan write a whole book on that kind of thing oh. yeah tom cruise as well famously breaks his ankle but keeps going on the scene he, he runs on a broken ankle because he didn't want to break continuity um <laughs> I sometimes wonder if he, if Tom Cruise has some sort of running bet with the Grim Reaper. Dude, I don't know. Like, I truly do not understand that man. Like, and not just the whole Scientology thing, but just there is there's something about that person. There, I don't understand it. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, to invoke King of the Hill, that boy ain't right. <laughs> Bobby. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not Southern enough to do to do it, so that's the closest you're gonna get. <laughs> well, again, I can't do accents, but I I can generally get a Bubba out, but I can't do much more yeah. than that other than Bubba. But um, when it now taking all taking all that into all that into account, you had name dropped the the fact that you could have your movie be a musical, and I'm curious if that's something that ever came about during testing. Yes, that, that is actually a rule that came specifically from the play test that I did with the Tabletop Journeys. If you're not familiar, it's a really cool podcast. Uh, I, I've know to know, I got to know them pr pretty well. They ha were very gracious to have me on. We did a, a full a full playthrough on their feed, so you can go back and listen. It's like three episodes long, I think. And um, Liwanika just started singing the song. It was just... It just it became like a recurring bit that we all just kept singing every time he would start singing, we all start singing. You know, I, I'm also, I do a podcast in addition to all the RPG Academy stuff I do. I do a podcast about the TV show Smallville. I started rewatching it during the pandemic. I rewatched all 10 seasons. I was looking for something to do because I'm a moron. I don't already have enough to do, but I wanted to add to it. So I started a Smallville rewatch podcast. And one of the things I noticed was how often they would do needle drops in that show the song was just like textual to what the characters were thinking or feeling. And, you know, it's just, it's a staple in action movies that you have your needle drop where right in the middle of action, an action, like a song starts playing. So it's sort of like all coalesced together. It's one of the ways that you can affect your dice pool. After you've rolled, you don't like the result. If you can name perfect song that would be playing at that moment there's no gm so you don't have to justify this to anybody but if you're like oh man the, the best song right now would be this you can take one of your results that was a blank so a two through a seven and consider it a success which will give you basically a, a plus one change to your overall dice pool result you start singing the song or you can get anyone at the table to sing it as well you know, it's the table's option if someone wants to pull it up on YouTube, if no one really is good at singing or doesn't want to, but you pull it up on YouTube or Spotify and you start playing that song and take a one and turn it into a success, which is a, it's a plus, plus two change because you're taking away a negative one and you're adding a plus one. It's one of the ways that you can affect your dice pool after the fact is by basically it's the needle drop mechanic. Each player can do it once per entire game. So it's not something you can do every turn, but... Once or twice per game, hopefully somebody will be belting out journeys. You know, don't stop believing at the right moment. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the game? So I think right now, so it's it's currently in a Google Doc. 
Um, and part of the Kickstarter is I am going to do a, a, a I'm not calling it a rewrite. I'm not rewriting the entire thing, but I'm going to go back through it and review every single part and see if it can be fleshed out a little bit, maybe clarified a little bit. I might even move some sections around. Uh, but right now it's a hundred pages. Uh, that's all the rules. There's like 25 pages. It's just the trope explanation. Some of that's charts, you know, the, the character sheets in there, the, all that kind of good stuff. So I would say probably by the time I'm ready to go to print, it's going to be between a hundred and 125 pages. Cause I'm definitely going to add some, it's not going to be a whole lot. I, I would, I, I hope honestly that I don't get to 125 pages. I would say it's going to be in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. How, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark. Yeah. So the Kickstarter actually has already ended. It ended last week. Uh, we were successful. We, we were able to fund. So everybody who backed at any level is going to get uh, what I'm calling the ugly PDF next week. And it's basically the Google Doc that I'm currently using. I'm going to turn that to a PDF and everyone's going to get it. So no matter what happens, if I get hit by a bus next week, we'll get a version of the game that you can play. It's the same version I'm currently using when I play it or do, did play tests. Mm-hmm. But part of the funds that we raised for the Kickstarter, additional art. So I've got multiple pieces of art that I've already started commissioning that are going to come in go through one last round of editing. So after I do my my writing my writing pass, we're going to have a professional editor edit it, and then we're going to have a professional layout artist incorporate the art and make it look really, really pretty. So when that's done, everyone will get that PDF as well, and then it'll go off for printing. So I'm hopeful that everyone will have a copy within a week. Everyone will have the pretty version within about five to six months, and then physical copies within a year. All right, that's so- that sounds perfectly good. And I it's my be- first book. I wanted to build in some extra time because I I would rather it be early than late. I, I'm, I'm I use the Star Trek Scotty method under promise over deliver. Mm-hmm. I really hope it'll be like closer to eight months. I wanted to give myself that extra time because this is the first time I've ever written a book. I've I've run multiple successful Kickstarters for my convention, but I've never actually. And also, like the book was pretty much done before I ran the Kickstarter. Like again, I want to do some touch-ups, but the book was written before I ever went to Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. And again, I will be looking forward to see to seeing how it de- how it develops and what sort of craziness comes of it. <laughs> um, if Tabletop Journeys is any indication, the crazy has already begun. Good. Yes. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Had a great time. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) Well, I'm the designated driver. I am a teetotaler, but um, it's sometimes fun to hang out with people who drink because you get to remember all the stories they wish you would forget. Well, in my case, I'm the one who who usually ends up having to get the keys. And um, if I say, give me your keys, I'm not asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Again, I, I appreciate that. Because, <laughs> well, there was one case where, I, where it was a case of, okay, you either give me your keys or you either give me your keys and I'll let go, and I'll let go or you pass out and I'm going to take the keys anyways. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, but. And of course, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>